I was told that I was scalping of tickets on eBay. <laughs> so what can I say? It's a sign of the times, good times. Um, so many of you have very gracious, I've seen you at Rekindle, old long-term associations and friendships that go back, uh, in my case, more than 30 years, and um, asking how things are going. So uh, let me just put it in a, in a very simple uh, three-word sentence, and that is uh, living green. I'm absolutely, categorically living a dream. When I left the uh, university uh, as a tenured professor to seek out trying to uh, do something to help doc better understand how to apply nutrition medicine in their practice, it seemed like a very lofty other tier goal in 1882 after my two years of sabbatical at the Pine Institute. Um, my parents thought it was crazy that I'd give a tenure and uh, college education would be paid for my kids and the president of the university loved me. I could teach whatever I want to. I had the biggest research group. Uh, and you know, why would anyone foolishly do this? Particularly father that always wanted to be a university professor, which makes it even doubly challenging. And I'd say just simply, uh, the reason is here. This is it. So it's been a good run, but it's only started. Uh, you are all compatriots started this project to transform healthcare in a time of great need. And it's healthcare that occurs uh, at every level, the psychosocial level as well as the biomedical level. And by harnessing this extraordinary wisdom that we're developing as well as knowledge, solutions to previously intractable problems can be realized. Miracles can happen. In fact, it can become reproducible standards of care. That's what we're here to do is to find out how we can miraculous uh, examples that the exceptions of the norm and convert them into becoming norm. If you think back to the turn of the last century, uh, Fleming, Alexander Fleming and his discovery of cell in the mold metabolite uh, in the petri dish and how that transformed medicine and the miraculous nature that a person that was limited to die from a septic disease could by taking a small molecule of fungal metabolite by the next morning be well. And that was an absolute miraculous uh, occurrence. You know, even the concept of giving somebody a mold metabolite uh, intravenously sounds totally counterintuitive. And that's why medicine fought it so hard at first because it didn't seem right. Now what's happened is we not only expect the therapy uh, so routinely to work, but we're upset when we have antibiotic resistance. Uh, so it went from miracle to a standard care to disillusionment that doesn't work all the time. Well, so there will be parts of what you will hear today that have that transferability, that can become from stages of miracle to stages of standard of care by diligence, compassion, and exercise, and I would guess, the right kind of uh, uh, thought process and, and uh, proof of concept. So today I'm going to be speaking, as, as I'm sure the other speakers uh, will as well, about this gray area between that which we know and that which we are learning to know and that which we aspire to know. And it's a very uncomfortable place to be, so I, I don't want to kind of give you a sense of omniscience or a sense of we have all the answers, um, but a symbol of somewhere in this secret of information you're going to be exposed to from uh, some of the world's experts in this field will emerge ultimately through the kind of diligence and passion and, and proof of concept, a new way of approaching a cancer that will be more successful and will ultimately make a disease that isn't so dreaded become a, a, a standard chronic disease that we manage, like we manage hypercholesterolemia with, with statins or lifestyle therapy. So that, that's a big context. When I uh, sat at the opening symposium with David Jones and my wife Susan, who uh, was a co-founder of the IFM, uh, in 1991 at our first symposium in Maui, we had to cajole everybody that we could uh, find off the street to, to come attend the first symposium. Um, most of our family members were there trying to fill the seats. Um, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was with a lofty set of expectations and goals that ultimately we might be able to be fortunate enough to recruit some of the best minds and brightest minds across multiple disciplines and different perspectives uh, so that we wouldn't discriminate among degrees, we'd discriminate among commitment to quality and excellence. And uh, we would bring the best and brightest from every discipline to try to sit down and talk through very complicated issues in healthcare and, and the nature of managing chronic disease. That was a found conceptual framework of uh, the Institute for Functional Medicine. Now to watch it evolve and, and see that uh, Dr. Yoko Norno has been so great as to be the uh, chairman of the Institute of Functional Medicine since uh, uh, my stepping out of that role and uh, Joe and Dr. Zarn being uh, in, in my place. And now transition to a new chairman of the board for Institute for Functional Medicine, Dr. Mark Hyman, uh, which will now lead the uh, Institute uh, in the next phase of its growth and development. I thank Joe so much for his extraordinary efforts in serving as the chairman up to this point. And, and of course, uh, my computer in arms, uh, since we were young Turks, and it's hard to believe that we were once all young Turks, that's Dave Jones and I, who's had a uh, uh, kind of presumption to sit in the audience of the Northwood Academy for, for Venice meeting in 1976, and sit there as uh, just a happenstance like me, you're near as a day, as you didn't know until you came to this meeting, and we're both grousing, saying we'd do this meeting better, and uh, <laughs> be careful what you ask for. <laughs> so Dave and I have had this, this privilege of traveling on this road together, and he's done such an admirable job in the clinical action of the Institute for Functional Medicine and Functional Medicine. So David, thanks for all your recording <laughs> And of course, our new, uh, the new executive director of the Institute for Functional Medicine, who is, a, is a one who I've admired and, uh, and, and had very high regard for many years. He actually was uh, years ago for a short period of time uh, in employment in our company in Big Harbor. Um, and that's uh, Lori Hoffman, who has now taken on the uh, executive directorship. And I see Lori back for kind of overseeing the, uh, the webcast. <laughs> and of course, the uh, associate director of uh, curriculum for the Institute for Functional Medicine, a person who ran our own functional medicine clinical research center uh, under my direction for a number of years and absolutely uh, 
um, precise, precision, excellent, uh, balanced uh, commission who uh, brings organization to a higher level. That's Dr. Dan Lucchese, who is uh, very responsible for this meeting. So, Dan, thanks so much for your efforts. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, as, as I get into the material, uh, that there's one thing that has gone in my life 28 years now without missing a month, which I feel kind of proud of, actually, and that functional medicine update every month interviewing the clinic. And yeah, thanks. Really, what I want to say is that there are two principal people that kept functional medicine alive. The first, of course, is uh, Jay Johnson, my colleague since 1976, has recorded every word I've ever spoken since 1976. So Jay, wherever you are, uh, I'm probably out of the room, but oh, there he is right there in the back, so Jay, thanks man. And then lastly, uh, standing over there on the wall is, uh, is my, my, the person who's really keeping the one legacy of information alive and well uh, through our Facebook and our website and a synthesis and a functional medicine update, and that's my colleague and friend, Chris Yuri, so Chris, thanks very much. So, now, how about the program? That's why you're here, not because you're all these uh, kind of historic uh, thank yous, but uh, the program was really put together, uh, as David said, by an extraordinarily uh, skillful group of people, and I'm not including myself in that group, but uh, two of the principal people that were involved in this uh, curriculum uh, development, other than Dr. Gazer and Dr. Jones, uh, were uh, Dr. Mary Hardy, Dr. Dwight McKee, uh, who I worked with uh, very, very creatively in uh, selling the speakers to form after flow. So I guess if you want to make any criticism, you can make to me. If you want to give a compliment, you can give to them. Um, they, they did an absolutely remarkable job, and Mary Hardy's constant refrain to me uh, in a very loving way, very respectful way, Jeff, we're here to help patients. Don't get caught up in your intellectual mojo, Jimbo. So um, you know, I'm going to try to do the best job I can as I go through the material. Uh, not that uh, my neighbors in the doctor as I go through the material, uh, but I, my, my ultimate objective throughout all of this, as, as is with all the other presenters uh, in which we've had presenter meetings, to prepare ourselves to collaborate on our presentations, is uh, how can we deliver their kit of patients in the end? And how can we assist you in having more tools in your tool bag uh, that would be helpful in uh, recontextualizing, as, as Christian said, the concept of cancer as a chronic disease? So I really uh, want to thank both Mary and Dwight so much for the privilege to work together with them in the development of this curriculum. Um, and lastly, probably uh, the most important of all, is I want to give a uh, special appreciation and thanks to you. Uh, most of you have come long distances. I uh, told last night we have uh, representatives over three countries here this year. Uh, many of you have had to give up practices uh, to uh, take vacation days in boat, which means not earning money today. It's, uh, all these things are real in the world of today. Uh, and all I can say is that uh, from the behalf of functional medicine, and me personally, I want to thank you for your dedication and sacrifice to be here. We'll do everything we possibly can to make this a sacrifice in time and money and energy that will pay dividends. But I want to thank you for your constant and continued support of uh, functional medicine and IFM. So, thank you. Now, now we get into the meat of the matter, right? So you pick up your syllabus and you wonder how fast I'm going to speak. <laughs> so uh, let me just give you a quick uh, summary. Uh, we have uh, 220 slides in the presentation spread out over the, uh, uh, the first hour and a half and then the second hour. So I'm very privileged to have on the program this morning two and a half hours, which is like huge luxury. I try to use that very, very prodigiously and efficiently. And what I want to say as I get into this material is that I know that this landscape that I'm trying to paint a picture of, which is the playing field that your presenters, the experts, will be speaking to the rest of the program, is a very expansive landscape. And it's, it's, um, it has many uh, potholes in it. I was trying to, get, uh, try to avoid the potholes, or if I step in the not that too deeply, but I think it's likely to say that somewhere throughout my words over the course of the next two and a half hours, I'm going to offend every one of you. Uh, because I think this is a very, very emotionally charged, very high energy, very intensive um, topic. And, uh, and I'm going to try to be very... Uh, mindful, respectful of the sensitivity, but I also think you, you want to hear what, what my opinion is. So uh, there will be opinions that will be expressed. I'll try to contextualize some opinions. I will apologize up front here for any time that I offend any of you, uh, but remind, remind that it's in the spirit of this open dialogue and trying to create uh, a voice as we move through the next three and a half days. Okay, so let me dedicate this. As David so eloquently did, and uh, I, I feel that same level of energy of trying to kind of hold back this sense of uh, responsibility. But this presentation is dedicated uh, to all cancer victims, survivors, families, and loved ones. Of the, that, that have confronted either directly or indirectly uh, cancer. And also dedicated to cancer care providers and researchers that have fought valiantly against the disease, which is very, very complex for the reasons that we're going to be going through in the next few moments. Uh, I feel very humbled and, and very small, actually, in the face of all the extraordinary uh, love and compassion and effort and energy and money that's gone into this field uh, and trying to represent it to you. So uh, recognize I feel a little inadequate, but I'll do the best job I can. It should not be assumed in this presentation the information provided represents a complete solution to cancer, but rather represents a state of evolution understanding of how molecular and cellular biology, genetics, epigenetics, environmental toxicology, and neural endocrine immunology intersect to provide a functional medicine approach to the management of cancers or chronic disease. So that's the context of what you're going to hear from me over the next two and a half hours. Now, I'm not an expert at all in this field. I'm, a, I'm an intellectual gadfly. But I'm reminded of this article that authored in 1977. That, that is a picture of me in 1977. <laughs> so if uh, yeah, I know. My, my kids they say, well, you got to kid me, Dad, please. Well, actually, I'm not sure I was younger than my oldest son is now, so it's like a little scary. But, but anyway, uh, the slice is to say that I've been hanging around this field for a while. Now, why do I show you this, uh, this Prevention Magazine article that I wrote in 1977? The reason I started that is that I had just attended in 1976 
uh, Pierre David Jones and Medicine, Northwest Academy of Medicine, and Medicine being to say we can do it better. I just gone to an American Chemic Society meeting, 1976, which was a week long course on the uh, chemical carcinogenesis, the emerging origin of cancer. Remember, this is Nixon's war on cancer period. And we thought we really understood a lot about it. And I came away feeling like, because I've been to a week course, I was really knowledgeable. So I went back to the university and I gave a lecture, a three hour lecture to all the faculty in the faculty center on the emerging understanding of cancer. Talk about hubris and soft forest. <laughs> well, uh, I'm conscious I don't uh, reduplicate that problem once again by suggesting today, you know, some 30 some years later, 33 years later, that I will, uh, I will be able to present answers. I think we have come a long way in understanding. What I like to do is a snapshot mosaic of where we've come from and where I think the trajectory of where we're going is thinking as it relates to the, the new understanding of cancer. I also want to thank my colleagues because you're going to hear throughout the course of my presentation a number of papers that we published at work that we've done at our uh, Metapleomics uh, Research Center in Yakar, Washington, and our functional medicine research center that Dr. Joe Lamb and Dr. Bob Lemon and Dr. Jeff Horner and Dr. Anna Mick are involved in at Gig Harbor. And so I, I, it would be very, I think, um, uh, would be a mistake if I took ownership of this work because it's the hard work of many of these people who are, uh, are part of my team. This is a, my dream is having this team that I can uh, really learn from every day. These are very, very talented, dedicated people that come from around the world to uh, work full time on this project with us in, in Gig Harbor. And uh, I'm, I'm energized every day I, I drive into our facility, our campus in Gig Harbor with this group of talent. They're really quite an amazing group of people. Now, what are the principles underlying this presentation? Uh, there, there are five principles that uh, set context. Everybody has a bias, everyone has a point of view. So here's my point of view so you can understand you know, where we the chat might be based on your perspective. Uh, number one, uh, I'm, I'm saying cancer are a result of the intersection of genetics, the genetics environment of the individual. They're not a legacy of a, of a gene that tells you we got to get it. Uh, they're, they're complex interaction of all these variables. And so this concept of cancer gene is uh, relative to the risk. It's not absolute. Uh, second, many cancers are rooted in the disturbance of functional physiological states, and I'm going to really explore what that means with you, because I think that's a context that we can deliver primary care into this uh, model effectively. Number three, many cancers have long preclinical stages that at all these stages are susceptible to intervention. So if you understand where that trajectory is of that patient early on, we can intervene before we need very hard gene therapy to avert or change the course of that trajectory. And I think it's asking the right questions can produce the right answers. But that's something I learned in philosophy class as a freshman in college. The question you ask produces the answers you get. You don't ask the question, you don't get the answers. So that's going to be part of our discussion. Number four, cancer for any patient has become a chronic disease that man long-term management. The question is, who's going to do it and what are they going to do? So we're going to talk about that. And then lastly, primary care providers have significant opportunity to deliver important long-term care cancer patients using functional medicine principles. Now what does this all translate down to? It translates down to this kind of a concept, this little snapshot. Cancers to me, and I hope I can make this fairly clearly over the subsequent discussion, represent an altered orchestration of functional physiology. They're not just like a plain event of one thing happening in the cell in isolation. They're part of an orchestrated uh, response to a, a complex milieu of change that's occurring in the environment of patient. So yes, a cell may undergo reversion into a cancer or precancer state, but it is embedded in the soil of an environment that can sponsor or, or uh, support that type of process. And so with a systemic, uh, uh, systematic uh, alteration, not just a single cell working isolation. So cellular rhythm and dance of life alter in response to different environmental signals and creates this different cellular architecture that we call oncogenic architecture. That's, that's my model. And I use the word dance, very, very important here, because what you're going to see throughout the course of my presentation is this rhythmic dance that leads either to an outcome that we call an emergent structure of health or an emergent structure of disease. And I want to emphasize the emergent structure of all of those are pretty potentially locked into our genes. Let me say it again. The emergent structure of disease is locked into a potential of our genes just as it is the pluripotential potential of health. In fact, disease may not be an unusual state. It may be the usual state in that environment that the body responds to the environment in a way that's consistent with its message. That's a different way of looking at disease. It's called an emergent structure that produces diabetes or a disease or a cancer. So I'm going to come back and talk more about that principle. Now, what do I mean by dance? Well, I think the best way of demonstrating dance is to show a little visual. So if we go to the video, I'm going to take a little bit of your time for a minute, and we'll just talk about the emerging view of the dance. So here you're looking at lymphocytes, right? Tumbling down the blustering binding through the membrane receptors to cellular architecture, creating signals to the bilayer of the membrane through the laminar structure, putting architectural changes in lipoproteins. You see the lipid mass, the lipid mass or transport proteins that are involved with cholesterol, phospholipids, that engage the internal working of the cell with outside activity. That signals to the uh, actin and mouse fibril and neurofibril network, the cryptin messages transduced through the cell. This is all intercellular signal transduction. It travels down through the lattice network. This lattice structure ultimately reaches the deep structures of the cell, the various organelle, the lysosome, the mitochondria, the ribosome, and ultimately the nucleus. This is constantly being reformed and regenerated all the time in real time. It's not static, it's dynamic. It's being responded to in part by the environment itself. As you have this kind of recreation process occurring, it's recreating itself in the context of the environment that's changing. As the fibrils are made and, 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 and they broke down and remade, it's reforming the cellular architecture to engage in an infinitive. You have these transport molecules that are transporting throughout the cell, these extraordinary new machinery that's going to produce the infinitive of the cell in response to a changing environment. As the information then is transduced into the internal parts of the cell, the cell is this plastic environment, it's dynamic and changing, electric and furating to respond in fact to those new environmental conditions. And in so doing, you're producing new proteins, the ribosomes, you're producing new uh, 
translation protein alteration by phosphorylation by kitchen uh, oxidation. These proteins can travel to various organelles like the mitochondria in the power of the cell. They enhance, enhance bioenergetics, or they may in fact uh, move themselves into cellular membrane. They translocate and become part of a, a plumbing model of the cell membrane. They become antennae. They'll pick up new messages from the outside environment, transduce new information to the cell. The cell is a constantly dancing, changing, morphing, altering, dynamic process of creating a rhythmic response to a changing environment, and eventually it leads to the expulsion of various proteins that send outside signals. These may be cytokines, these may be prostaglandins, these might be hormones that then send distant messages to alter part of the body. And all this rhythmic dynamic process of the frame is a demonstration that we are in a constant dance, that what we think is that is not, it is all dynamic, it's all holographic, every cell is in connected connection to every other cell. It's that rhythmic particular process that ultimately leads the regulation and physiological response of which cancer is embedded in the stable emergence structure. Oh, boy. Whew. I think I need to take a break. Wow. Okay, so with that in mind, let me now talk about uh, two parts of my presentation. You actually heard the whole story, now I can kind of go to sleep. So, uh, this first part, before the first break, is I want to look into a cancer based on this model. Uh, define cancer as a functional physiological uh, disorder. I want to look at the role of the primary care provider in cancer. I want to look at cellular biology of cancer, and I want to look at how it's set, what I'm going to call oncogenic potential. That's a term I've come up with. You may not look at it, I'll find what that means. In the second part after the break, I want to talk about new strategies for underlying mechanisms of cancer, uh, creating the functional medicine a context by the application of matrix. Uh, so looking at cancer, the disorder of uh, functional physiology, and what a toolkit. Now, as uh, Dr. Jones indicated, I've uh, authored a couple of recent papers in uh, alternative therapies. Uh, the reprints of the articles will be available this meeting uh, uh, in the exhibit hall, uh, for those who didn't have a chance to read them. Um, and I want to be very uh, cautious to say that I am positive that I'm going to say things here that you'll hear many other times by the presenters. That's good. Uh, kind of reproduce information is good, reinforces. I've always thought that you only learn stuff after you've heard it like three times. So uh, I, I, we did all collect our slides and, and, and kind of call out slides that are overlapping. So you may hear articles that are going to appear in my presentation, but I hope you're, you're not feeling like we're uh, kind of maligning your intelligence. We're just trying to show where some of the important hotspots are in this field, some of the important information. Okay, so part one, leading a new cancer to think cancer is a functional physiological disorder. Where does it all start? It starts with good clinical observation. Every discovery, every bit of knowledge started first with discovery with observation. And all of you who are clinicians every day are making extraordinary discoveries in the way that you observe your patients, the way you have your wisdom that has accrued over your years of service to your patients. In fact, that kind of body of knowledge, that, that wonderful wisdom of clinical uh, observation, is what ultimately drives the scientists who like to know every little detail down into their silos to try to figure out the explanation for those observations. Now, I don't know if you uh, remember uh, Dr. Issels, uh, but he's one of a whole group of early pioneers in the field of integrated cancer therapy. Um, his book, uh, which has been reprinted now, Cancer Second Opinion, uh, really describes, uh, going back uh, over six, seven years now, the development of a, kind of a model of this gene environment connection to cancer in a very clinically savvy way. Now, we're all the answer in, we're all the explanations present, we know the mechanisms, of course not, but observation is observation. And from that, ultimately, can come the right questions to be asked about how we take an observation of an of a, uh, unexpected result and convert it into a reproducible clinical pattern of behavior. So I, I want to really say that uh, for most of you who have been in the field, your body of knowledge, your observations, which uses the pattern recognition of the brain, which is power more powerful than any supercomputer, makes kind of connections that maybe leads to abstraction. But those leads of abstraction may actually be right. But not every leap of abstraction is right. It deserves and demands for exhaustive evaluation, right? As was transferable and sticky and can, can be uh, reproduced by somebody else. Just because you've observed it and meet somebody else will have the same experience. So what's science all about? Science metaphorically is a tool that allows you to take somebody else's observations and transfer it with a reasonable high probability to your experience, right? That's what science is about. So you have a probability saying, uh, based on the statistical significance of the study uh, of um, PO5 or less, it would suggest it's not random chance there's something valuable here. If I learn that, so maybe I can have more than a 95 chance probability of being the outcome as well. That's, that's kind of the, the science model. Now, as Dave said, this concept of the primary care provider of preventing services to cancer patients is really uh, gaining a, a significant traction around the world right now because it's recognized as a consequence of changing demographics and disease prevalence that we're getting more and more uh, cancer patients that have been fortunately successful to go through a, a therapy an hour in, in that state. What do I do from here? And so, as this article, uh, what appeared recently in the Australian Family Physician uh, Journal said, determining the current and potential roles of the primary care provider in cancer care must occur in the context of a rapidly changing landscape in the cancer environment. If there's any one thing I hope my talk will bring to is what does that rapidly changing environment look like? How can PCP play a role in uh, providing service in this rapidly uh, changing environment? So the journey is uh, the preclinical understanding, diagnosis, treatment, and then, as Dave said, uh, survivorship uh, and trying to manage that whole process. And as David showed uh, in, in his presentation, this journal Oncology article appeared in 2007, I think is a very interesting bridging article between a subspecialty, oncology, 
and between primary care. And the title of this article is Beyond Traditional Prognostic Indicators, the Impact of Primary Care Utilization on Cancer Survival. In this article, I quote, it says, primary care utilization in the early phase of cancer treatment has a marked effect resulting in a reduced mortality risk in patients with instant lung cancer. Now, you're going to ask, well, what does that mean? How much an outcome? Is it significant or insignificant? So here's the data. The data is quite compelling. Uh, if you look at the number of visits, this is 3 to 23 male veterans with primary lung cancer, 25% not the PCP, and they had poor survival, meaning they have the highest mortality. Uh, 46% who had two or more visits with PCP had almost five times the length survival. Now, that's a pretty compelling statistic, right? So you look at the data there. You don't want to be a person in the yellow curve, do you? The yellow curve is not a good outcome. You would like to be a person in the gray or even better uh, curve. So it suggests that uh, uh, if you see a PCP, a, a, a help manage the conditions of collateral tear disease it's treatment, that you're going to have a better outcome. And in fact, as you probably saw last year in the Journal of the American Medical Association, there was a very uh, nice uh, article that was discussing a, a study that looked at home-based study and exercise program on functional outcomes, and we emphasize on functional outcomes, just that word is the expectation, as known in many studies, uh, among cancer survivors. In this general paper, they say, quote, five-year survival rate for early-stage colorectal cancer or prostate cancers currently exceed 80% and increasing. Cancer survivors are at greater risk for second malignancies and accelerated functional declines. Just want that word sit for a second. A tailored diet and exercise intervention program reduce the rate of functional decline. Now, who implement that? Is it the oncologist? No, it's not. So there's none need here, isn't there? The question is, who is providing this service that will improve outcome, reduce uh, recurrence, and enhance function? And that's why you're here, right? You are that group of people that provide that kind of service. And in fact, the editorial that followed, uh, or was companion to this paper, entitled Challenges in Design, Interpretation of Observation Research and Healthy Behaviors in Cancer Survival, they want to say a very interesting statistic. And I, this is a, a statistic that was quite uh, profound for me. As of 2006, an estimated 11,400,000 people in the United States alone are living with cancer. This increase of people living with cancer, a chronic condition, has stimulated a question as to whether diet, exercise, and weight control may have beneficial effect on survival. So you see we're at, at the nexus. This is a transition point of thinking about the etiology of disease. So this is the right time and place for this symposium. These questions are just now really being addressed. So last month in May, actually this month, excuse me, in May of 2010, I had the privilege of interviewing on functional medicine update. And I hope you'll have a chance to hear this interview. It was one of the of tear to my eyes, I have to be quite honest. I had the chance to interview Dr. Hall Ted Holman. Some of you know him, he's a professor uh, at Stanford Medical School. He was originally at UCS Medical School. Uh, he is a doctor's doc. Uh, when I spoke with him, I could just see he must have had unbelievable patient uh, relationships over his years. Uh, professor Eric is in the 80s now. And he has been talking for 30 years in medical school environment about the difficulty in the way, or the, the, the limitation, I guess we better, in the way we're teaching medical students hospital-based medical practice and uh, not doing a good enough job in teaching them in an ambulatory care chronic environment how to manage chronic disease. And um, he actually implemented at UCSF and now at uh, Stanford a program for uh, uh, patient self care and chronic disease is overseen by a nurse practitioner, overseen by him, it's a separate unit of uh, the Stanford uh, hospital. And he um, uh, has now introduced this into curriculum in Stanford uh, University Medical School curriculum. And this article, he uh, wrote one mini article he's written on chronic disease the need for clinical education. What he says is if you really want to manage chronic disease more effectively, you've got to have a different strategy than that which you use to manage acute disease. Acute disease, ultimately, you uh, are successful at self-limiting, a patient gets well. Chronic disease is a life, uh, lifetime of managing a condition. So what do you need? A, number one, it should be patient-centered. I love hearing that, right? That fundamental tenet uh, of the uh, Institute for Functional Medicine Foundation. Dr. Leo Allen put that to us. Number two, care is over time, both in the clinic and at home. The patient does come in for treatment and leave. Or for most of their life is at home. You have to teach them something about how to manage their condition. Make them self-efficacious to use Albro Bender as concept of self-efficacy. Number three, the self-management must engage that patient in the recognition that they are the master of their own universe. They are in control. It's not that there's something is undo them, that the disease is unfortunate, that they have bad genes, the bad luck of the drawer, they didn't fill an application card, and uh, woe with them. Uh, what they need to recognize they are in control of the trajectory, how they want to proceed from that point on. You give them the tools to manage their condition to the best of their ability. And number four is a group visit, right? The different differentiate itself often from acute care management where it's one-on-one. -on -one. Group visits are extraordinarily beneficial. There are many studies that published on this. When you bring people together with similar conditions and have them talk one another with a facilitator, a nurse or a doctor, to get them to share information because often they know more about the disease than the practitioner. They certainly know more about their disease. So getting them together in groups can be beneficial. There's also, by the way, a billing issue here that can be beneficial to by putting people in groups. So you can spend more time with the patients because you can do group billing for patients that are uh, uh, aggregated. Number five, uh, you need to work in a collaborative fashion. That means not silent thinking, not uh, I got the answer to this problem and I won't talk to anybody else. It's you, you're using nurse practitioners and stress management people, exercise therapists, nutritionists, dietitians, you know, all sorts of the complementary care model to create an environment and the context for healing. And number six, uh, integrating care between a specialist, in this case, uh, in uh, cancer, the oncologist, and the BCP. So you develop an alignment and uh, find a commonality for the objective, which is really to help the patient. So that's uh, Dr. Holman's uh, uh, very, very, I think, sage advice. Now, Mel Greaves has written a very, very provocative and interesting book about uh, this whole concept of cancer, which we're going to include and incorporate in many of the things you're going to hear presenters talk about. He's asked a question in this book, 
cancer cell from a week? It's a very interesting question. If you think for a moment about Darwinian natural selection and ask how does cancer cell survive? If, if natural selection is occurring systemically in our bodies, is that a strong cell that proliferates at consequence of it be stronger than other cells that it's supposed to, or that's, that's living in the same environment, or is it a weak cell that somehow it foils or self cell into survival? And, and how does it actually ultimately emerge to be a de-differentiated uh, angiogenic uh, metastatic lesion when it may have neat personalities that other people rec other cells recognize the form either? So what is this about the evolution of a cancer in, in a human body? It's right kind of a little test case of evolution in a culture. Is cancer therefore multiple? And I first started in 1976 in that um, uh, component that I mentioned. It was pretty much thought that a cancer cell was a cancer multiple. In other words, the thing cell, they replicated and uh, trans you know, transmitted their genes from cell replication to cell replication. So if you went in and took cells from a uh, lesion, a cancer is, uh, lesion, you'd find that those cells have the same genes. So that would be monoclonal. Now with all the gene array stuff we have, all the same, no, not polyclonal. And so they develop a community, right? And the community is survival of the fittest. So when you change the environment, what happens is many of those are not a fit for that environment. That's oncology, isn't it? It's in chemotherapy. You may kill 99%, but you've uh, selected for those unusual cells that are somehow uh, genetically okay with that or they can survive uh, to that particular chemotherapy. So what happens is people become chemo-resistant, don't they? Because you're doing an extraordinary study on evolution, on natural selection. By the way that we're treating very toxic molecular substances, you're really getting the fist to the fit. You can kind of fit to the, the eye of the needle. So this concept of polyclonal is a very, very important concept that we talk about because what it suggests is there is not one treatment for cancer. In fact, cancer is not cancer, it's cancers. And I think that's a very important test to put on the back of cancer because cancer, as we're learning, is very unique to the cell type and very unique to the personality. So they all have certain characteristics in common, but they differentiate themselves in their unique personalities that require different things for their growth or survival. Let me give you an example. One of the common themes of cancer cells is they're not really good on the novo isoprilin uh, biosynthesis, or metabolic uh, uh, pathways for producing uh, uh, squalene, uh, farsol, lanosterol, and cholesterol is, uh, is fairly low. So what happens is they need cholesterol to make up membranes, and so what do they do? They recruit cholesterol, don't they? They can't uh, make it very well, so they, they have it as a nutrient. So what happens in a cancer patient to their blood cholesterol levels? Yeah, they can go very low, can't they? And, and when you ever see a patient that has precipitous lowering of their blood cholesterol and haven't made a lifestyle change or on statin, you start thinking, what's going on here? Because cells that are of this type, this genealogy, uh, are not as efficient in making cholesterol, but they need it for their proliferation, so they, they use it as a condition essential nutrient. So next is what environments are less desirable for cancer cells? That's really the theme of the whole uh, meeting, isn't it? How can we find an environmental status for that group of aberrant cells that makes it so unfriendly for them that they leave? So, but it's friendly enough that those tissues still enjoy the environment. That, that's, that's really the question we're going to talk about. And how does natural selection potentially relate to cancer prevention and therapy? And we have to know something about the history, the family history, we have to know something about the relative uh, genetics of the individual and the environment of the individual is in. So Gil Mertens, uh, a friend of mine, he's at uh, Merck in Germany, has uh, authored this book, uh, which I think is very interesting, Find Cancer as a Disease of Functional Physiological Disturbance. And he points out that if we were to really look at the characteristics that you find all cancer, uh, they, they fulfill in, in a great part each of these characteristics. So these are things that we did in the back in the 70s. So let's go through them just to remind ourselves. First of all, you need to initiate a cancer, right? So some cell that was reasonably normal in its physiology becomes abnormal. So we initiate a different cellular personality. Then it transforms that cell into a, you can even look different under the microtope. That's where our histology starts to play or our, our, our pathology. Then it, it de differentiates into this kind of juvenile cell, periodic cell. Uh, that's why we have, uh, you know, uh, various types of cancers that are associated with, uh, with pregnancy, where you have all these pregnancy hormones, and it causes kind of juvenile cell to take root and become potentially malignant. So this, this, uh, this de differentiation process. Then the cell starts proliferating as this kind of uh, unusual juvenile cell. Then develop an ability to invade by seeing out some enzymes, kind of eat up the connective tissue and allow it to kind of force its way into uh, environments that are not necessarily at home. And it develops its own blood supply because it has to feed itself for it to grow, so that's the endogenesis. And then lastly, it has to uh, find another home, and so it uh, has this process of met uh, met uh, metastasis where it breaks off and, and finds another home. We're going to talk about each one of those. And each one of those steps, by the way, uh, is a sequence of events at the start of the level, like the little uh, video um, I think I showed you, that can be modified by the environment. Now for adult cancer, many of these processes from initiation to metastatic disease takes 20 years. That was a so-called re hypothesis. It's a, it's a 20 year rule. Now obviously for infant cancers or juvenile cancers, that's not true. There's something that's been going on probably in Europe, maybe even conceptually, that's already starting that process uh, going. But the majority of cancers, non-juvenile and infant cancers, they're a fairly long waiting period. Or in fact, the women with breast cancer, it's been said on average, it's between 15 and 20 years from the initiation of the process until at no pause, the woman develops breast cancer. So that's a long period of smoking guns or whatever to do something, if you understand where the person is. Am I making sense here? Okay, so now what are some other characteristics that are uh, associated with cancers? Uh, and, and this isn't an exhaustive list, so you know, I, I hate lists personally, but sometimes they're useful to kind of look at the, the mosaic. So let's go through some of the characteristics that uh, associate themselves with all cancers. First of all, increased DNA damage. You see chromatin instability, you see breakage of the DNA, you see fragments, you see pieces of DNA. This is not good when your book of life starts falling apart, right? Because it leads to misreading. 
and, and, and it opens that portion of the book that are really accurate and shouldn't even be read by adults. So, uh, <laughs> so that, that great DNA damage is a characteristic associated with oncogenesis. Uh, that then is associated with all, obviously the alteration of chromatin, because not only the DNA itself, but remember the DNA is wrapped in this unbelievably complex code of chromatin proteins, the histone and histone proteins, and the nucleosome structure. And that all starts to kind of unravel and look different at the microscope where you have right DNA. And that uh, can also be modified then by epigenetics, where you start getting different tags put on the, uh, the histone proteins or on the DNA so that you get a uh, different epigenetic uh, regulatory mechanism going on. And now we start to, to see, and this is where the world becomes very complex. I, I, I sort of heard myself, I know too far out of field here, but you've been seeing the function of this update for the last couple of years. I included a couple of people who are really doing fundamental work in what are called small interferon RNAs. Now, this is a big new breakthrough in our understanding of how cellular architecture changes in the, in the face of the changing environment. We used to think that all the information was being put in DNA, kind of just read certain messages in certain cells that didn't read other messages, like the liver had only the liver message and the heart only read the heart message, and the cancer cat had read all sorts of confused messages. Well, now we're recognizing that the regulation of these uh, genetic readings, so to speak, is controlled not only by epigenetics, but also controlled by the production of what are called small interfering RNAs. There are little fragments, there's thousands of these that are produced in a cell. These are all recent discovered, by the way, within the last 10 years. And small interfering RNAs have the responsibility to block messages in certain cells by sitting down and kind of in, uh, inhibiting uh, the readership of certain uh, book of life messages. And as, as you get into an altered cellular environment, these small interfering RNAs change in their um, personalities in the composition to open up certain areas of reading, close down other areas of reading. So you might get tumor suppressor gene that's now not read, and get an oncogene which is read. And you, so you say, well, what regulates the uh, production of small interfering RNAs, which are unique to certain cancer personalities and, and certain cancer theologies? And again, this energy is the environment play roles in not just in the environment, I mean, nutrition, exercise, stress, environment, chemicals. They play roles in modulating small interfering RNA production and how that iterates the expression of your book of life. So you say, what is cancer genetic personality? It may be an individual who has a um, propensity in their genes towards the uncoupling or uh, exposure of an oncogene or the exposure of depression of a tersipicer gene. Right? So it doesn't mean that that genetic characteristic in and of itself causes cancer. It means that they have a susceptibility fact for a process that's likely under certain environmental conditions to result in that cancer. Am I making sense? Okay, so that's my genomic instability modified epigenetics. Uh, that leads to alteration in cell cycle physiology and checkpoint integrity where we would hold them. Uh, ways the cell divide and regulate their uh, cell vision alters, uh, and then that uh, is regulated upstream, the uh, kind of higher order executive centers that control all this process, somehow tell the inside of the cell, remember the, the book of life is here in our genes, in our nucleus, nucleus of cells, and in the mitochondria, the information that, that the genes are going to get outside the cells, so you've got a regional gap, yeah, don't you? Stuff outside here like having a bad day. How does that get to your genes to say to the genes, by the way, we're having a bad day, or we're having gluten, or we're having infection, or we're having a chemical exposure, how does that ultimately get into your few genes? It gets through it, that message is um, translated through a process called intracellular signal transduction, right? Intracellular signal transduction. So this whole concept of signaling, it's like the rhythm of the dance that creates in the, uh, the, the movement of the dance. The intracellular signal transduction, you can see as the drummers or the recurrent instruments, they're going to send the, uh, the, the vibronic energies, the vibratory energies, ultimately through kinetic molecular uh, processes to the nucleus that then uncouples or, or um, activates certain report genes or regulatory regions of the genome that then create the expression patterns that ultimately become oncogenic. Am I making sense here at all? So that, and that process of enzymes, if we're 0500 of them, that cause that or allows that transduction process to occur both good and bad, actually there's probably no such thing as bad. It's all probably a relatory process, it's just the outcome I'd consider bad. The process itself, I don't think we should evaluate this in whether it's good or bad. That process is regulated through these 550 different enzymes called kinases. Kinases are phosphorylating enzymes, phosphorylate other enzymes in the cellular milieu, either makes them active or inactive. And that's how you have this extraordinary web of interconnectedness between the outside environment and the inside function is through the regulation of kinase modulated um, function, uh, activity. That then alters in cellular signal transduction. That can be seen then by, uh, in the individuals, altered immune uh, state status, altered chemokine productions. In, in cancer, you know, you often have alteration in pro-inflammatory cytokines, alpha, 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 Ultimately, that can drive hormonal change in the patient at growth level. That can be a kind of a, a lower level thing. So prostate cancer or breast cancer or endometrial cancer or liver cancer. You have an endocrinological outcome in your hormonal shift. Okay, so that's, those are some of the cellular characteristics. Now, let's talk about initiation. I'm going to go through each of these steps, initiation, uh, propagation, uh, it's kind of individually. Well, first of all, let's go back to Pearl Pot in the 18th century. Recall he was an extraordinary observer, uh, recognized the chimney sweeps in London. Uh, this is the coal burning era, right? But uh, everybody was burned coal. Uh, pollution in London was atrocious. Um, and he found these chimneys, which were these uh, diminutive uh, boys and, and, and teenage boys, uh, they started developing scrotal cancer. And uh, so he tried to make an association between the coal death and the scrotal cancer. And that was, many people feel, kind of the burying of the whole concept of chemical carcinogenesis, the tracing down of that story. Uh, I had the privilege many years ago, actually, was founding meeting American Public Medical Association. My roommate, that being a lacrosse constant, was Des Perkett, uh, father of the dietary fiber colon cancer. And uh, he could speak about stool in more eloquent ways than anyone I've ever seen. <laughs> actually, he spent two days talking about stool, so it was really incredible. But, um, <laughs> 
He's also a gentleman uh, who was in public service for uh, Lenin uh, in, in Africa, uh, who worked with Maasai uh, tribes in Africa, and uh, not only did he develop this fiber of colon cancer and fiber uh, digestive disease connection, but he also uh, f uh, found this, this virus uh, that was associated with lymphoma called Perkett's lymphoma. So that kind of merged whole concept that maybe there's an infectious component of cancers, well, the, a viral, and of course we know this is true, and there are many cancers that are uh, like cervical cancer that are associated with uh, infection. So we'll talk more about that. Then there's Marie, uh, Marie Curie and, and her husband, who as you know, uh, were really pioneers in, in uh, understanding uh, the ionizing, the effects of ionizing radiation, x radiation. Uh, you know, if you want to talk of giving life for your science, um, they certainly did uh, as a consequence of their exposure to radium uh, and beta alpha emitters, and ultimately uh, died of leukemic uh, disease. So this is the whole concept that uh, high energy, uh, high frequency uh, radiation can be uh, carcinogenic as well. Then we have the cigarette smoking story. It took 35 years to find convince the medical community there's something uh, to that. In fact, the last ever chapter in the Back Life magazine, the full page ad for a cigarette smoking, and it's a doctor with smoking saying, I smoke, was 1974. Yeah, the last ad, a full page ad of the Back of Life magazine, 1974, the physician smoking. So, uh, you know, it takes a long time sometimes to get a concept across. Then this is following nuclear at a carcarin association uh, with a uh, chemical carcinogenesis. Uh, there's the xenoestrogen that we're now worried about with regard to toxins and tumor promoters. And there's this folate deficient diet store, which is a very interesting. The animal on a folate deficient diet was supposed to carcinogens have a much higher conversion to initiation of cancer than animals that are on a folate sufficient diet. We're going to talk about that in more detail. So those are exogenous factors, right? That's outside the body of the person. Then we have these endogenous factors. What are the endogenous factors? Well, Mary Claire King, University of Washington Medical School professor, extraordinarily brilliant uh, lecture geneticist, um, uh, was the one who discovered ERTA 1 and 2, MACA 1 and 2. Um, I don't know if you know her history. Uh, she was an uh, uh, anti-war um, Berkeley student during the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, she dropped out of graduate school to um, go to uh, do meditation. Uh, she came back a brilliant person to rejoin science and, uh, and ultimately now is one of the strongest uh, advocates for uh, women's health, breast cancer, and, and the gene. Um, and, and has really pioneered I think, this whole field of molecular genomics in, uh, in cancer. I'm going to say more about it in just a moment. We'll come back and talk about that. So we, we got this BRCA1 and BRCA2 story. We now know about mutated P53 autogenes and their relative uh, increased oncogenicity. Uh, we know about two suppressor gene mutations now uh, that ultimately lead to increasing uh, prevalence of cancer. And we know about mutated kinases now with the VEGF receptor kinases and uh, things like Levica. You probably know Levica has become a billion dollar blockbuster drug uh, as it relates to its ability to block uh, a kinase associated with the uh, vascular endothelial growth factor kinase signaling pathway because this is a very commonly mutated uh, signaling pathway in certain cancers that can be blocked with the stroke of Levica and there's a positive outcome. So this, this story about an endogenous factor is mutated uh, cells and how that influences functional outcome is certainly another part of the story. So what does uh, Dr. Jim Carnes say, who's been out for 40 years, a world leading expert in this whole field of uh, uh, cancer epidemiology? In the British Journal of Cancer in 2009, he talks about the mysterious steps of carcinogenesis because he points out this simple minded model we have that a carcinogen like benzoanthracine, benzanthracine attacks the nucleus of DNA and produces cancer, and that's the cause of cancer. It's a very simplistic and naive model. And that's probably why there are many more subtleties to the process than just a single hit with single carcinogen. Why we haven't been able to clearly define uh, that chemical pollution is a question uh, a contributor to cancer. There's still a debate about this. Because he goes on to say carcinogens often have to work with other promoters. And those of you who have work in this field of carcinogenesis, you know about this because if you use MBA dietyl benzanthracine to a tumors in rats, it doesn't work very well unless you add a neutral promoter called crotonol. Crotonol in itself is not a carcinogen. And it's neutral. When you give it in a, in a blind state as a control, you give crotonol, the animal does get cancer. If you use DMBA with crotonol, it just causes weapon uh, uh, promotion of cancer. So there's this co-promoter double hit theory. How do these interact? How multiple things are environment? We often use simple kind of models saying one thing is an activity, one drug, one outcome. But this environment is very complex with multiple things hitting multiple targets to create a symphonic orchestrated distortion of physiology. It doesn't just hit one thing. In fact, as you know, drugs that we think of an endpoint, like ACE inhibitors or beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, we thought they had one target molecule that they would hit, like angiotensin converting enzyme. When they're put on a DNA array, however, we find these molecules have three potential effects across hundreds of genes that we never understood because we didn't study them that way. What we did, we screened these high throughput screens against one biomarker and called it the best molecule. And we assumed that's all it did. When actually it may have multiple effects, probably does multiple effects. That's why now seeing stats are pitrophic, right? They don't just hit HMG OA reductase, they hit all sorts of other things that influences their orchestrated outcome in patients. So this concept that our environment has multiple hits is not unreasonable based on pharmacology. And it's been proposed this kind of concept of a two-hit mechanism for cancer initiation. And carcinogen-induced cancer often appeared a decade after exposure. That was even a key back in 1775 pot. And carcinogen-induced cancer is more related to the duration of exposure than the strength of a single exposure. Right? This is a very important kind of clinical takeaway. That yet yeah, someone might have had a really bad exposure to something horrible, uh, and that's not good. I'm not advocating it. But maybe much less it actually have a lower relative risk of cancer and if a person is at a low level of exposure of that substance over a long period of time, like smoking. Right, let's use it as an example, two packs per day for three years. So, um, and then you say, why doesn't every two packs per day smoke for three years get lung cancer? And I think that's why we're here. Because it's a very, very complex cancer and gene and environment. It's a very complex interaction. Okay, so Bruce Ames authored this extraordinarily important and pressing article 
uh, that appeared in uh, Science Magazine in 1983. It was actually a cover article. You might have been, if you remember back then, remember the uh, picture of mice on the front of the cover called Dietary Carcinogens and Carcinogen. And what uh, Dr. Ace pointed out, he's discovered the IMS test, which is a salmonella written mutant test we use now for studying carcinogens of, of chemicals. Um, and what he uh, found out was that many natural substances that we consume every day can be potential carcinogens based on the IMS test. They can, uh, they're just mutagens based on a test. So then you say, well, why aren't we all getting rampant cancer if we're eating stuff in our diet that is uh, potential cancer from natural source? I'm not talking about chemical modification. And his, uh, his answer was that for all these substances that may have potential carcinogenic potential at very high dose in foods, there are anti-carcinogens in food. That, that modulate the suffering of disease is orchestration. It's not like taking one molecule out of time and saying, let's look at uh, quercetin by itself. Now, if you have quercetin at very high doses of animals, uh, they would be rat and mice at what we call doses, you produce regular cancer incidence in those animals. So by a strict uh, kind of uh, AIMS test, you might say they're carcinogens. But if you give quercetin to a human, you know, like that, you might be evidence in their urinary output of carcinogens. So there's something going on here as it relates to multiple things, all of which interact in an appropriate way to create a positive outcome versus one thing at high dose in a uh, uh, kind of a, a pharmacological model. Okay, so now let's move to metastasis. Uh, this is a wonderful review paper that was uh, published in the English Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago. I really uh, urge you to read this if you're interested in understanding kind of the state of affairs with uh, our uh, view of metastatic uh, progression. I'm just going to pick out a couple of things of this article that remains worthy of the paper. So, first, I quote, Metastasis is the end product of an evolutionary process in which diverse interactions between cancer cells and their microenvironment yield alterations that allow these cells to survive. Okay, that in itself to me is very important. We can't control the cell, we can't have an effect on the microenvironment. That's a reducible, modifiable fact, right? Okay, that's number one. Second, primary tumors consist of heterogeneous populations of cells. Remember I said polyclonal. Heterogeneous populations of cells, whereas metastasis is the selection for rare clones that represent less than 0.1% of cancer cells in a circulation. Meaning, here's my translation, it's highly unlikely that a, even a transformed cell map will become metastatic unless the environment really favors it. Let me say it again. It's highly unlikely they cell mass that's been transformed will come to static unless the environment favors it. Because this natural selection process does not allow just a cell to walk out of two mass in a systemic circulation without having to fit about. It's going to be selected for, first by um, kind of uh, natural selection, by uh, mutation, and secondly, by the environment that allows it to proliferate, or like just uh, resonance and to proliferate. Moving on, next quote. Random genetic and genetic alterations in cancer cells combine with a plastic responsive microenvironment that support the metastatic evolution of tumor. Again, I want to emphasize microenvironment, we have some control by self-efficacy in the patency of the microenvironment. Microenvironment includes, and these are some of very important regulatory factors that we can assist patients in getting control of. Number one is hypoxia. Now you probably know hypoxia is an environment that favors anaerobic glycolysis, right? And tumor cells are love kind of that environment. They, they don't like oxygen that much. So that's why you have hyperbaric oxygen, you know, as one of the treatments for cancer. So if you can increase, you talk about exercise, dance, yoga, you'll think it increased perfusion of cells with oxygen, that, that's good, right? That, that's, that, uh, that's chemotherapeutic approach. Um, activating uh, mitogens, uh, so we want to remove mitogens, right? Activating agents with citronal genes and simulation with growth promoting substances. Now, what's that last one? Let's test an example of growth promoting substances, IDF1, right? Or insulin. So is hyperinsulinemia an oncogenic stimulating? Yes, it, it certainly is. I want to talk a lot about that. In fact, we have Dr. Bear Boyd, uh, who presented at IFS Symposium a year ago, for bringing that concept to us at one of our previous symposiums. Now it really evolves a major thought in oncogenesis. So that leads me to define this concept, and, and you might like the concept, I'm just going to throw it out there, that I'm calling oncogenic potential. Oncogenic potential is what state of the environment of the patient might seed or nurture or incubate the potential for this initiation, propagation, you know, uh, antigenesis, and metastasis. So here are some thoughts about, and this is not an inclusive list, these are some of the things I'm going to talk about. First of all, disturbance is an in insulin signaling. Hyperinsulinemia is an oncogenic stimulating event. Okay, so hyperinsulinemia. Number two, specific inflammatory states, chronic inflammatory states, like elevated HSCRP. You think of that heart disease, put oncogenic potential in there as well. Number three, increased signaling for growth hormone messenger molecule that stimulates cellular proliferation. What would be that? 16 hydroxyesterines, or 17 beta estradiol, or testosterone at high levels, or IDF1, or insulin. Things that are stimulating cellular cycling, right, to stimulate cell replication. That's part of the, uh, the process of oncogenic potential. Next is increasing genome instability. What, what do that? Well, things like radiation, like, uh, well, for instance, being out in the sun too much and getting UVB, UVA radiation, or X-radiation, or any kind of ionizing radiation. Uh, things that then create genomic instability, chemical carcinogens on that uh, activity. Next is altered mitochondrial bioenergetics and result in oxidative stress and theoretical induced pathology. That's something everyone in science is very familiar with. You're probably already addressing in your patient. It's one of the tensory uh, uh, fundamental concepts within functional medicine, and it also increases on genetic attention. We've got a kind of environment present. Next is altered epigenetic methylation, histocellation, and protein phosphorylation. We're going to talk about that. Again, these can be regulated, can't they? So metal donors and things like acetylation, butyrate, which is produced in the gut by fermentation of uh, solid fiber, is an agent that triggers in situ histone acetylation. 
So you say, well, why do you have more um, uh, carcinogenesis occurring in the uh, colon of someone who's on a low fiber diet? Part of it is brought by lower butyrate production and lower histone acetylation and silencing, or, or uh, excuse me, in this case it would be uh, activation of specific uh, tumor suppressor genes. And lastly, cellular hypoxia and associated shift towards anaerobic metabolism. So this is kind of a partial list of the, on, this, the, the systemic state event in a patient that results in increased oncogenic potential. Now, with that in mind, as David said, how much weight do we put in these versus the bad luck of the drop that we got the genes for cancer? And he already cited a study of the 4470, 4,786 pairs of identical twins that were from twin registries in Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. And uh, in this study, they, because they have very good uh, social medicine, they have very good medical record keeping, they went back retrospectively and evaluated in these identical twins. These weren't fraternal, these were identical twins. Looked at 20 sites, including stomach, colon, and lung, breast, and prostate. And if there's a high concordance of cancer, then you would say, well, gee, it might be principally genetic. If there's a low concordance, then you might say, well, it's more environmental. So what did they find? Conclusion, the finding is that the kid that suggests that the environment has a principal role in causing spreading cancer. And in fact, you gave a kind of weight factor is something like 70 30. 30 percent might be related to genes. All there is genotypes in this polyglot of genotypes, and 70% is what the environment does to pick the genes to create a different outcome. You can't control the genes directly by, by molecular decision, but you can control the environment. That's concept. So there's a big room for invention using the appropriate uh, uh, knowledge. Cancer is disease related to dysfunctional energy management. In other words, how does this mitochondrial oxidative free radical pathology connection? So energy flows, as you know, in a highly controlled process and well regulated physiology. This leads to what we call negative entropy, negative entropy. In other words, let me say it in another way. We're all made up of stardust. So what's the probability? in random act of findings that the stardust in the universe collaborated to make our bodies spontaneously, just by statistical mechanical probabilities. There are so many zeros to write at this point, we can say it's, it's not going to happen, right? But we do exist somehow. This, this stuff, the organic stuff that put us together, the stardust, is against all of the universal tendencies to, for things to go to hell in the handbasket for charge. <laughs> and you know that in relationships, you know that in your office, you know that in, I mean, you know, you put more energy into it, you get what you expect, right? So, so our, our functional integrity the passive of this process, the orchestration of our dance is controlled by an entropy that regulated by bioenergetics because working on stream against energy gradient that's called Helen and Becker. You follow what I'm trying to say? So it's unlikely that we can maintain structure and function for energies, but we beat a loss. Why? Because we have this common, dominant uh, process, something people call, people call it a lot of town, that's almost a swear word. But there's something that's life force that creates this emergent structure that defies us. And it's energy regulated. So your energy goes away. And I'm speaking about every kind of energy, psychosocial energy, biomechanical energy, uh, physical energy. As it starts to be dissipated, your ability to maintain structure against the entropic disorder of the universe goes away. Cancer is distorted in chi catastrophe, isn't it? Because some, some other process take on your energy, and it's draining that, uh, as David said, a cause of many cancer patients. It's not a tumor itself, it's an energy deficit disorder. And so you can put whatever you want on, on the district figure, but it's an energy deficit disorder. So where did energy come from? Well, we're not photosynthesizing plants. So it comes from oxidative phosphorylation, restoration, the power of the cell mitochondria. It has its own DNA, it's connected in communication with nuclear DNA, and it's all constricted to the environment. So we don't kill our, our, our mitochondria, but what do we do to our mitochondria? It's very interesting. I had a thing about this the other day, and I don't know the answer to this provoking a thought in your mind. We're the most medicated society that's ever lived in the history of the human species. Not just prescription medication, but OTC medication, self medication with alcohol, and with recreational drugs. Now what's the burden of all the things on our genome as it relates to mitochondrial bioenergetics over the course of time? Is it benign? Could be that a lot of the things that we're seeing are energy deficit disorders related to the burden of agents that have ultimately damaged our mitochondrial machinery. We know that there are drugs, uh, many of the, uh, 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 the uh, each drugs um, are in fact mitochondrial toxins. We know that they're antioxidant mitochondrial toxins. So what happens if we keep damaging our mitochondrial machinery? Does it make it less able for us to defend ourselves against this natural tendency to kind of distribute our energy willy-nilly? So it's just a thought I want to throw out as a kind of a second thought, particularly as we now start to recognize that if you sample uh, water in the Great Lakes, um, around some of the metropolitan regions that you'll actually be able to with the new uh, technology, uh, measure of every pharmaceutical drug that we've given patients that's in water, uh, you know, very, very low level. So we're starting to have a very interesting example of polypharmacy. Okay, so energy flow is controlling cancers. We have positive three cells, a of primitive energy economy, this anaerobic glycolysis. We talk about the Krebs effect. Uh, environments in which uncontrolled excess energy is present are associated with cancers. Uh, we have this cachectic state. We have uh, physiological stress. We have uh, xenobiotics that increase this, uh, this kind of uh, metabolic energy catastrophe, obesity, inflammation, radiation, smoking, and so forth. So how do we bring energy back into coherence? Uh, there are all sorts of things like music, dance, thought, meditation, reflection, peace, grace. These are powerful words, I think. And I say, well, it's just words. But those are words that vibrate through our whole being. Through this whole dance of life, they rhythmically relate to how we're functioning at a somatic level. They create the uh, kind of the plasticity that you saw in that little um, cartoon as to how these different cell architectures are born. So if uh, you're listening to heavy metal rock, you're maybe sending a different set of messages. If you're watching video tubes of uh, YouTube's of violence, if you play video games, everything is about killing. I mean, I don't have all the studies, but there are studies out there, as you know, that talk about the, 
harmonics of this information that comes into us from our receptors and creates a rhythmic effect through these messenger systems. So that's my consolidating energy in the piece versus catastrophe. In fact, there's a book that was given me years ago uh, in one of my seminars. This was a very um, treasured gift. It was a psychiatrist in Toronto. He was an old age gentleman, probably early in his career. And he said, you know what you're talking about? Uh, I have a book that you might want to read. He gave it to me at home and read it. It was a story about uh, the transition psychiatry when the Rorschach test started to come into play as a way of that's a psychiatric archetype. And he was, uh, this book, with the, and it was kind of a meta study, in which uh, this psychiatrist had been in practice all these years was talking about the way that the same Rorschach tests were interpreted differently at different periods of time in his 50 years as a psychiatrist, right? So when he first started, he said that the patterns that would be um, reflected on by showing the picture to patients was a pattern that would generally talk about lack of opportunities, lack of alternatives, down and in, deep and dark, kind of uh, senses of I have no control and, uh, and I'm a victim of the universe. And diseases at that time were non diseases, right? They were deep and dark, down and in very individual diseases. Then later in his career, those same pictures when he showed them were more eliciting response in the patients that were things like, I'm out of control, I have no time, uh, I'm just a victim of the universe, everything is happening to me too quickly, I can't keep up, uh, I, I'm trying to process too much energy. And what were diseases? Cancer and heart disease, diseases of poor age. Interesting little metaphor. I mean, I don't know what to make of that, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting thought-provoking concept that our image of how we exist in our society creates a signal that comes to our body that our body then responds in kind to that signal to be prepared for the environment that we perceive, right? Okay, so let me go back to Mary Claire King. I talked to Dr. Uh, King here uh, a couple years ago about this paper that he had published because it was to me so provocative because when women are uh, found to have the BRCA1 two genes and have a family history of breast cancer, uh, it says the case in three women that no one have undergone prolactic bilateral mastectomies, right? Remove her breast as a preventive medicine. It's really very severe preventive medicine. Um, and so in talking to Dr. King about this, uh, I'll, I'll give the quote from her science article. He said, lifetime risk of breast cancer among female mutation carriers of BRCA1 2 is present 82%. Risk appeared to be increasing with time. Before 1940, it was 24%. Same mean, right? She goes on to say, lack of physical exercise, obesity, and LS may be important modulating factors for risk and barriers. Now, does this just stick in your mind strongly about the, uh, the death sentence that occurs with certain genotypes? The difference between 24% with the same genotype and 80% is insignificant. That's the difference. Our biostatistician figured that out. What changes the environment, the, the social cultural context, diet, you know, the, the things that we do daily living? That's changed. The genes have remained constant. So I think these are very profound thoughts. And you know, the largest epidemiological study ever done on global relationship and environment factors in cancer prevention was published. You can find it on the web. If you go, you put a lot of paper reprints, about 250 pages, I think. It's entitled Food, Nutrition, Physical Activity, and the Prevention of Cancer, a Global Perspective, uh, funded by the World Cancer Research Fund, the American Institute for Cancer Research. And it goes on to say more than 50% of cancers have a nutrition component in radiology. 50%. That's a modifiable factor. Now I want to go to Bob Woman, our medical director. Uh, Bob is a very underspoken, you know, slaughter and deep kind of guy. We always listen. He speaks because he has a lot of wisdom. And years ago, when he went back uh, at Boston University Medical Center, uh, he collaborated with Lawrence Cushy and a group of other authors in writing us what I think is a very profound article on uh, the uh, Cushy program for cancer therapy and prevention until the microbiotic diet in cancer. I think if you went back and read this today, this was published in 2001 in the, in the Journal of Nutrition, I think if you went back and read it today, you would find a very, very profound, particularly in the context of this uh, particular symposium. Because in the article, he talks about, or they talk about the values of my macrobiotic diet in that it induces self-efficacy, the patients to take control. It's, it's a departure from the way that most of them have been eating. And so it really is a conscious practice, a different way of approaching connection between diet and their physiology. The diet in the uh, Cushy program or in the uh, macrobiotic program is very complex. It's uh, obviously mentally processed. It's very highly plant-based, so it has a lot of phytochemicals. And as a consequence, it has a regulatory effect on the body that's vastly different, vastly different than what we would find at fast food establishment in the United States. The signaling molecule that comes from a fast food diet, regardless of macronutrient composition, for such cows, fat, protein, and carbohydrate, the signaling of molecules to speak of the genes from a fast food quick start meal in this country is vastly different, almost chuck and cheese different from that of a macrobiotic diet. Also chloride, right? right? Just carry for an hour. So the concept of nutrient density, not just uh, well, did we get enough vitamins for vinegar, very, very big result of family rates. You know, did, did it really create a proper signaling outcome? And I think if you read this, uh, this article in the Journal of Nutrition, you would come back and say, there's some wisdom, deep wisdom in this macrobiotic approach that we need to relearn, relearn, relearn. Because it teaches us how to engage the patient in control of one of these very important variables that relates to function. And in fact, uh, David Eber, who's been a uh, penner, our supposed advice of the years, uh, co-authored this wonderful book, George Blackburn and um, Ray Go, in uh, Nutrition Oncology that was published a few years ago, uh, looking at adjunctive nutritional support for cancer patients using the proper information signaling from diet to signal the genes, cancer nutrient prevention, personalized prevent, perspective, and participatory. What is that? Those are the four P's of medicine that Snyderman and Good talk about that are part of what we incorporate, obviously, within our functional medicine curriculum. Let me say them again. Personalized to the individual because every cancer patient is different. Preventive, meaning let's focus on that which we can do early, not wait till the uh, house is on fire. Prospective, meaning let's look forward, not backward, because you can only change that which is in front of you. What was, was. Don't run your life out of the rearview mirror. 
Let me say it again. Don't win your life by the rear view mirror. That's what happens if you get too high to sell spreadies. Excel spreadsheet tell you what was if you're doing accounting. Account is retrospective. What is, is what you're going to put in the cell of the Excel spreadsheet about tomorrow, a day after. And if you think of yourself as a spreadsheet, what interest are you going to make in your litany of life? Because you can only like, correct out what goes forward. So that's what we mean by prospective. And lastly, you got to have participation. If you don't go home with your patients, they have to be separated. So that's what uh, Paul said. Holman was talking about when he talked about teaching patients to fish. You don't just give them the fish. You teach them the fish. Okay, so then you say, well, how does it all work together with a um, molecular biology of cancer? And this is a whole topic. Obviously, we could expand the whole uh, symposium, but we're not going to. This is a clinical meeting. But I wanted to tell you that I have derived a lot of information I'm sharing with you in the remainder of my talk from this uh, cellular microbiology of cancer. I'm trying to append it or connect it together, dock it together with what we have seen experientially and, and clinically and from animal studies and epidemiologically. So it's a mosaic. It's a hybrid. And when you do this, you always run the risk of over -extrapolating. So I have great risk that I might convey to you uh, things that uh, I made association that don't really exist. But I'm going to try to pull these things together and let you kind of do the sitting device with the, the uh, wisdom of the other presenters that will come up uh, subsequently to talk about this. So I'm going to talk about the salt of tissue, the origin of the organism. I'm going to talk about the emergence concept. That's really what we're all about, how we emerge healthy structure function throughout the course of living from the same genes. Can the gene could produce cancer or the genes that could produce a healthy individual that lives within 100 years? And then I'm going to ask, is cancer a metaphor for disease of unregulated energy management in our time? It's part of our challenge, learning how to manage peak sex time impression, learning how to manage through a very complex life with multiple connections, which the internet gives access to information that also makes life very real, because you can't hide from anything anymore. Everything's transparent. It's happened 24-7. So why hasn't targeted chemotherapy worked in advanced cancer? cancer? And we, we can say it's, uh, its outcome is uh, punctuated with probably not living up to a billion. Uh, there are some notable successes. I don't want to throw those out, but well, I think we probably see that there are some problems uh, in getting full benefit from some of these extraordinary molecules that have been approved for chemotherapy. So why? So um, Jack Rister talks about this in a recent article, and he says, first of all, as I've indicated, cancer is cancer, so they're not one molecule for even the same name cancer, but they have different personalities as how they respond. And the complexity of disturbance uh, of that physiological state is what results in the testosis, and our approach to treat cancer is one cell has on a rye, which really doesn't match reality. Uh, by the time the cells start to divide and replicate, they kind of mutate and form a mosaic pattern, and they have a kind of a comp more complex physiology. Strong molecules hitting one target before, which is the approach that we use in chemotherapy, do not modify the complex story of the physiological web of the cancer. What they do is they may shut off one portion of kill cells or a one archetype, but they may leave unexplosed other cells that are protected from that uh, or selected against that particular molecule. Now that there is no value in chemotherapy, of course not, but now what you've seen if you're an oncology follower is the more and more use of cocktail, right? Why are you using cocktail? Because we recognize clinically that you're not getting all the cleanup from a same molecule against a single uh, target. So now, how many drugs do you need to put in the cocktail? Or is, are, is there an error approach by changing the environment to make cells uh, that are uh, oncogenic more susceptible uh, to the uh, therapeutic agent? So here's our proposition for consideration. Cancers in cellular biological aging are both physiological services associated with altered cellular signal due to a gene environment probation that is unique to the genome and the epigenome of the individual. Now this is a big thought. What I'm saying is that the archetype of genetic disturbance that relates to cancer is also associated with the same disturbance that relates to increased biological aging. Now is there any evidence for that? Yes, there is. There's a common biology of cancer aging. In fact, in 1951, Henry Lacks, as you probably know, gave the world to her cervical cancer, one of the great gifts she left us now with something like six tons of her cervical tissue that exists in laboratory around the world. In fact, the cell biology circles, it's very common to have your laboratory contaminated with the uh, uh, Lacks cells because if you are growing cells in your lab and you uh, lick an envelope that has mucus on it, it might cell in the air that's sick to the isolate, it grows and gets another lab and it's contaminated their cultures. Now you have hip cells in the lab. So she's, she's all over the world, right? These are more my cells. And we've learned more from Hurriata Lacks uh, cervical cancer probably than any single individual in the, in the history of cancer research. These are immortalized, meaning they've undergone some process that prevents them from doing what normal cells do, which is to undergo the Hayflick number. Remember Leonard Hayflick, the cell biologist at, uh, at Stanford, who discovered the Hayflick rule, which is cells that go about 50 doublings and they die. And that is in part a result of the shortening of telomeres over time. The telomeres short eventually, they can't get genomic instability, and so can't uh, properly replicate. So this, this concept of uh, uh, of normal cells undergoing uh, sequential uh, doubling, but uh, cancer cells being mortalized is a very, very interesting thing because cancer cells have more activity of telomerase enzyme, don't they? They keep lengthening their telomeres so they don't undergo the same kind of mortality that normal cells undergo. So you have this, uh, this construct of immortalization. It also changes the whole cellular signaling profile of those cells. They don't look like the cell uh, metabolically from which they were derived. Now I want to have a little bit of a moment of thought because often we say in science a very male-centered, uh, male-dominant uh, discipline and, and, and the doctors that are active medicine historically have males and the, the people who develop medicine are traditionally males. Well, you all probably know that's changing very rapidly. Uh, there, well, there's many women medical schools that are meant to that is to bring a whole new psychosocial environment to medicine that I think is a uh, need. Uh, in science, we're seeing many more uh, women, as I talked about Mary Claire King, who are uh, going on to potential Nobel Prize winners in fundamental discoveries in science, which has traditionally been a, a male or uh, discipline. The one who should won a Nobel Prize, and I went on for a moment, her name is Barbara McClintock, um, she studied Indian corn. 
and she was at this whole uh, research station for years and years. She had passed away a number of years ago. Um, there's probably no modern geneticist that did more for understand about the plasticity of genes than Barbara McClintock. She never won a Nobel Prize. Uh, she absolutely feels in the circle of genetic fields that she should be at least posthumously awarded a Nobel Prize. Uh, in her study of genes, when you probably asked if you've ever looked at genes, how is it that those uh, curves of the corn and all these different colors, when they all came from the same gene, right, of the initial cell? And it has to do with this whole concept of uh, epigenetic modulation. Uh, you get some uh, kernel that are purple and there's red or some are yellow because you change the gene expression patterns by epigenetic modulation through development biology so that that kernel expresses a different set of chromophore uh, than does the, the uh, kernel next to it. And, and that model is transmissible into humans, to all animals. And he was really the first person to actually study telomeres. And, uh, you know, so kind of the, the, the whole time, if you want to talk about the concept of electrical gerontology, it goes back to Barbara McClintock and so forth. So when we start talking about telomeres, or DNA damage, genetic instability, epigenetics, all interfering RNAs, and now something that's on the line of every person who drinks red wine, it's virgin red wine industry, sir, in one, with resveratrol, right, which we're going to talk about, he started saying, gee, is it, what is going on here as it relates to substances that are in our environment that may be consumed in our diet that are on by plants as adaptogenic agents to environmental stress in the plant that then produces an stress in the human, he calls no meta substances, right, that then can do all your gene spreading patterns and cause the uh, outcome of cellular physiology to be pro of it. Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? It's like, no, could there actually be such substances? And could have those substances also be anti cancer because they share a common soil in genetic disturbances? Accelerated biological aging, cancer, share similar genetic soil. So, Rick Warner, a good friend of mine, a colleague uh, at the University of Wisconsin, he helped us understand this, right? You've seen this, this study published in Science Magazine recently. So, what you have here, the pictures are um, macaw monkeys, and there's a uh, literates. Monkey A is one monkey, and monkey C is other monkey. The literates, they're the same uh, chronological collection. Now, if you look at that picture for a second, doing pattern recognition and very adept wisdom that you accrue over the years of living, what would you say about the relative age of monkey A-D versus a monkey C-D? You would say, I think C-D looks a lot younger than A-D. Yeah. Not only does monkey uh, C-D look a lot younger, but it is a lot younger biologically. In fact, if you look at the survival rate of the, uh, by the way, you prefer, I think, to be a red uh, line monkey and a blue line monkey here. A blue line monkey ate monkey chow ad lib, right? This was the appropriate diet for monkeys eating ad lib. The blue line, the red line monkeys, are those that have 20% restriction of their calories, not their micronutrients, have the same low vitamins, minerals, and stuff, but they do get the same number of calories. And what do you see here? This is the first example in a 20-year study actually almost a third year study now, of, uh, of the primates in which it shows calorie restriction modulates outcome in mortality. So you need to much more way to increase life expectancy in animals. Now, with that in mind, my say, what effect did it have on cancer, or diabetes, or heart disease? And I'm saying every one of the diseases was there prevented or treated, depending on how you want to look at it, so that the animal didn't get those diseases. Whereas the litter ate, ate and lived, did. Now you say, well, this is monkeys, this is humans. But this is rats, mice, guinea pigs, or dogs, cats, it's all been done, these are animals, or, or fat worms, or whatever. This is not humans. What I'm saying is, yeah, that is, we haven't yet done the 35-year control study humans, and they never be done, but it's certainly suggestive in it. There's something about quantity and quality of calories and diet that influences all your physiology in such a way as to create an outcome in the genetic soil of that organism we call disease or health. That seems to come across for this, in this day. So, with that in mind, in Drugs Discovery Day, this article about an anti-aging drug today from senescence proning genes to anti-aging pill. And what this article this goes on to point out is that numerous mutations alter lifespan in diverse organisms and can increase the risk of cancer. Most genes affect longevity and age-related chronic disease encode components of an interesting kinase regulatory pathway. This is a pathway we're studying in our laboratories and many other groups around the world called the mammalian target of rapamycin. Intor. Mammalian target of rapamycin. Now, why are we studying that? We're studying that, I promise you, this is one of the few charts you'll see uh, in my presentation, that Intor sits at a central signaling point in cellular physiology that transduces information from outside the cell to inflammation, insulin, hormone, cellular replication, cellular repair, replication, oncogenesis. It rides the switching yard, right? Intor. And individuals have found alteration in function of Intor is associated with oncogenic potential in many animals. And it's also found as a mutated uh, kinase in human, in certain human cancer. So many pharmaceutical companies are now after trying to find a way to modulate Intor. And it also turns out to be the central switching pathway that's associated with regulation of things like the two genes or so-called longevity genes, meaning it all has a role to play in prevention of health and longevity. So cancer, a unique disease unto itself, or is it a sidebar ontological outcome of a deserved physiology? That one patient could be heart disease, another patient could be diabetes, another patient could be hormenda, and another patient could be cancer. Because they share common modulation of cellular alteration and cellular signaling. Am I making sense here? And it's kind of the luck of the draw that do hit the genes, all these other variables that kind of combine together to kind of tell you what's going to be on your ICD not code. So here's one of many, many papers. This is a 2009 paper entitled Targeting Tumor Genesis, Development and Use of Intor Inhibitors in Cancer Therapy. Mammalian target of rapamycin is intracellular protein kinase physician at the central pen cellular signaling. The inhibitors of this kinase have been developed in patients with cancer and found particularly useful in a variety of different cancers, including kidney lymphoma, pathology, carcinoma, gap contents for cancers, in vitro, and on small cell lung cancer. Now, the interesting thing is that if you have that same molecule that inhibits Intor, you can animals, even in the absence of cancer, you can extend their life. Now I'm going to tell you 
then in a complex variety diet, that the reflective thing that I talked about with macrobiotic diet, there are natural mTOR inhibitors. So beware, are we eating information or are we eating calories? What's going on here? When we consume diet, is it information that's causing alarm, is it information that's causing quiescent of cellular physiology? So that's the meaning of systems biology, as uh, uh, Dr. Kirsten talks about in this article. We're not a collection of pathways, but rather a network of webs. Let me say it again. We're not a collection of pathways, even though we've, met, we've had to memorize our tests and recite on demand. Those are an artifact of what's really going on. We're rather a network of web. Cancer represents a distortion in the network as expressed in genomic, proteomic, lipomic, metabolic, and metabolic interface. This is called the interactome, right? That's the word the scientists are giving to it. Disturbances in the interactome give rise to a cellular outcome in emergent structure that's called cancer. Now that's a big mouthful. That's also a big paradigm shift, what I just said. That's a big paradigm shift. One emergent structure, as I said, in this distortion is called cancer. So if you look at the human disease network, maybe you've seen me in previous lectures use this diagram, this blue circle there on the lower left are different forms of cancer. And what I want to point out is although they have different histologies or histologies and uh, they have different ICD lines and different, maybe even different treatments, they all connect one to the other with fine, right? Because they share common soil and distortions of function. And so we are connected together if we look at these uh, particular diseases, these individual silo diseases, they connect in a mapping holograph to alterations of similar genes that are influenced by similar environmental circumstances. You follow what I'm saying? So we ask, what is the root cause? Is it the disease the, uh, the organ of its own self, or the disease manifestation of an alteration of the environment in which the cells exist? So there are many types of cancer screening tests. There's two, psychology, like a PAP test, colonoscopy, dermatology screen, oral screen, mammography, sputum analysis. There are cell-based genetics cancer risk factors like KRAS, CPC gene, HER2, BRCA1 and 2, T553, and BA226. These are cell-based genetic cancer risk factors that you're going to be hearing more about. There are serum and protein markers like cyclin E, uh, taloproteins, B16, BLCL2, the GEF, alpha fetoprotein, alpha-1 glycoprotein. These are all serum uh, markers for cancer that are used for tracking uh, success of therapy. And there are also urine and serum metabolites like catecholamine metabolites uh, like uh, vanilla delic acid and homo vanilla acid in oblastoma, low serum cholesterol we already talked about in elevated serum. That in B12, which is also another interesting thing often in cancer patients, is elevated serum B12, right? That's another kind of surrogate marker. So all these things can be assembled as ways of assessing uh, cancer. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is understand the nature of an individual, that patient's cancer, the personalized oncology, which is now starting to emerge right under our, our noses. In fact, this article that appeared recently in H1 and a therapy for patients with cancer changed gradually over the past decade, moving away from the administration of broadly acting cytotoxic drugs for the use of more specific therapy that are targeted to tumor. Tests based upon genes expressed by tumors will herald in a new era in personalized medicine. And what are the disturbances that are associated with these kinds of unclinic potential design issues? Chronic inflammation, altered intracellular signal transduction, altered mitochondrial bioenergetics, altered immune surveillance, chronic opportunistic bacterial and viral infections in the nasal, gastrointestinal, oral, liver areas, and altered post translational protein composition with glycation, oxidation, phosphorylation, nitration changes in your cellulite. So what are representative tests that you might use clinically? And I'm going to clinical panel or having to withdraw the previous time. Um, what, what kind of tests might assess the uh, landscape of that patient that would uh, give you some insight to the oncogenic potential? By the way, again, this list is not complete, but it's represented. How about two affecting uh, a 2-hour postprandial glucose insulin, along with hemoglobin A1C and therum IGF levels? That tells you something about the oncogenic potential of this insulinemia. How about a sentiment and a visual weight knowledge test for valuing phase 1, phase 2 detoxification in the, in the ability of that patient to, to modulate the uh, burden of uh, toxin uh, molecules? How about lactose mannitol challenge test? to evaluate gut permeability and, uh, and fecal calprotectin for evaluating gut inflammatory effects, and stool microbiology to evaluate aspects of GI immune status, knowing that over 50% of our immune system is cluttered around the gut. What about serum lipid oxide, serum hydroxydeoxymonosine, and serum isoprostase to evaluate with oxidative stress and mitochondrial oxidation problems that relate to redox difficulties in pre radical pathology? What about a ripperside membrane fatty acid analysis and a plasma CD36 and vascular endothelial adhesion molecule and intracellular adhesion molecule for measuring endothelial dysfunction and its relationship to immune determinants associated with cancer? And what about steroid hormone analysis, including estrogen tablets like 16 hydroxy, 4 hydroxy, and 2 hydroxy estrogens um, as part of our analysis? About autoantibody analysis, including TPO, any uh, nuclear antibody, and including the anti immune cell antibodies, along with genetic analysis of DR2 uh, and uh, DRQ8 for looking at uh, gluten related uh, inflammatory responses. What about vitamin D stis analysis by looking at 25 hydroxy and 25 hydroxy vitamin D? I'm going to come back and talk about why I think 125 might be valuable along with 25 hydroxy in just a moment. What about the analysis of high sensitivity CRP, a uh, lipoprotein, phospholipase A2, and IL 6 and fibrinogen, as well as uric acid as part of an inflammatory assessment? This is a bottom panel for looking at inflammatory burden beyond average state of CRP. What about lymphocyte telomer length and serum homocysteine, a uh, ways of looking at uh, genetic markers associated with the folate cycle and with a uh, chromosomal genomic ability? What about urinary organic analysis and looking for shifts in rope metabolism towards anaerobic uh, metabolism, which is a much higher oncogenic potential, and also looking for micronutrient insufficiencies 
and I saw antibody testing for H. pylori, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, Amidia, HIV, Hep and Hep C, all which is part of getting a broader understanding of whether it's a viral bit in that patient may contribute to their oncogenesis. And lastly, spin one cell buckle cell evaluation of micronuclei to actually visually measure under the microscope uh, where an individual has a genomic instability. You notice that not every patient is going to have everyone with test done. You assume, well, this is a lot of thousand dollars testing. But what I'm saying is the question we ask often determine the answers that we get. So what are your appropriate tests we want to assume when a person has early on in the trajectory towards malignancy before they need to be uh, blasted over with hard-hitting cell molecule to uh, be toxic molecular to uh, transform cells. So with that in mind, we're coming up to our 10 o'clock hour, which is your break time. You've been very, very hot behind you. have been for an hour and a half. I think you can see we've just touched the surface of a very dynamic, extraordinary time. There's never been a better time to build around. Thank you for being with us. Okay, if I can have you wait just a moment, there's going to be some announcements. Can I have uh, our chairman of the board and chairman and past chairman of the board come up? Is Mark here? First of all, uh, the break, you find that there's, the break room is over here with exhibitors, and there's also a pavilion. And in the pavilion, 